Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Clark, Dean and University Librarian at LaSalle University. I'm going to be our moderator today for this session, Making Connections Through Changing Priorities, Textbook Affordability, and the University Library. Uh, in March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic drastically affected higher education. At the University of Texas at Tyler's Muntz Library, it obscured our financial future and changed the nature of student life. Not knowing what our future budget would look like and given our students financial insecurity, we wanted to use what budget we had to support our students. In the two most recent semesters, fall 2020 and spring 2021, Muntz Library made purchasing textbooks a top priority. This project has paid off in two major ways. First, it was well received by students, faculty, and university administration. Second, it led to increased collaboration and conversation with faculty. Sorry, just a second. Uh, and this, uh, as librarians, we are always looking for ways to engage with faculty, and this project has given us a great opportunity. Like it has for many others, COVID-19 forced us to change our approach to student support. And in this case, change has been positive. We share our story to demonstrate how a disaster response can lead to innovative approaches to student success and faculty outreach. We hope to further the conversation among fellow librarians regarding the changes caused by the pandemic, their influence and sustainability. Attendees will leave this presentation with do's and don'ts about how to implement a similar program at their institution. And presenting this session today, we have Christine Forche, who is the STEM and Criminal Justice Librarian and Outreach Coordinator at uh, University of Texas at Tyler. She has a BS in Criminal Justice and an MLIS. In her spare time, she enjoys cooking, working out, and camping with her son and dog. Um, Sarah Norrell, is the business librarian and instruction coordinator at uh, UT Tyler. She has a BA in English and writing, an MSIS, and an MS in human resource development. In her spare time, she enjoys baking, spending time with her two scruffy dogs, Marshall and Petey, and taking care of her ever-growing collection of house plants. Uh, and then last but not least, Sarah Meish Lacombe, is the social sciences librarian at the University of Texas at Tyler. She has a MA in French studies from NYU and an MSLIS from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she is a dog person, an avid reader, and a Francophile. So at this point, I just want to remind all of our participants one more time to um, stay muted unless uh, you're called on. I will be watching the chat throughout um, if you have any questions or things you want to add. And at that, this uh, juncture, I will go ahead and mute myself and hand things over to our lovely panel. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Um, Again, like Sarah already said, we are here to talk to you about making connections through changing priorities, um, specifically talking about textbook affordability in the university library. Um, so like Sarah already said, uh, who we are, my name is Sarah Norrell. Um, at this point, we just wanted to show you our lovely faces because Sarah already gave us such a wonderful introduction. Um, if my co-presenters would like to speak up and say hello to everybody. Good morning. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Mike Chappelle, um, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Social Sciences and History Librarian at UT Tyler. Fantastic. So to get us started today, um, we have a lovely agenda for you. Uh, we are, of course, going to provide some background and context to this project and our endeavors. Uh, then we're going to talk about the results and um, the responses that we've had to this project, uh, followed by the next steps that we are planning on and what it might be like to start your own program regarding textbook affordability. Um, and then, of course, as always, we're going to leave time at the end for questions. So to give you some background about our project and our university specifically, 
The University of Texas at Tyler is part of um, what we call the UT system here in Texas. Um, there are 14 institutions, um, I believe, that span across the state of Texas. Um, most people know UT Austin um, as kind of the uh, home university. We uh, alternatively are located in East Texas. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, we're nestled in the Piney Woods region of East Texas. And geographically speaking, for you map people, um, we are kind of right in the middle between the DFW area and the Louisiana state border. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with East Texas, um, it's really a collection of small rural communities, small towns. Um, Tyler is one of the bigger cities um, and at just, just about 100,000 people in population. I know a lot of you are probably thinking that that's really small, but for East Texas, it's pretty big. Um, so for that reason, um, UT Tyler as a higher education option is very popular among um, local high school students, uh, local um, individuals maybe in the workforce looking to continue their higher education, um, and especially individuals who are trying to pursue graduate school or graduate studies um, while also, um, you know, managing their families, working full time, you know, things like that. Um, we do get a lot of transfers from local community colleges. Um, so, and we're also a very young institution. So that just kind of gives you some ideas of um, our population here. A little bit more about us. We were only founded in 1971. So we're still relatively young. Um, and as of two years ago, we are now comprised of two institutions. Um, so, you know, 1971, UT Tyler was formed. We've gone by many names um, and we have continued to grow. Uh, UT System actually founded um, our, I guess, sister institution, as we can now call it, um, UT Health Science Center. That is based out of a hospital. And so it's medical focused, um, it's a medical focused school. Uh, and it's very small. They only have about 80 graduate students, but that's on the north side of Tyler. And as I said, Tyler is not an extremely large city. Um, so about two years ago, UT System made a huge announcement that we were going to be merging the two institutions um, into one UT Tyler. Um, so we have five campus locations, two of them located here in Tyler, Texas. Um, and then we have satellite campuses in Longview, Palestine, and Houston, Texas. So for the size of our institution, um, we have a total of en enrollment of about 10,000 students. Now, if you had asked about our enrollment a couple of years ago, I would have told you that we were really shooting for about 12,000. Our numbers projected that, but then the pandemic hit and things got a little shaky. Um, so we are stable right at about 10,000 students. Um, due to the recent merger with the UT Health Science Center, we now have seven colleges and over 600 faculty members. Um, and also because of that merger with UT Health Science Center, we now offer 91 different degrees. 48 of those are undergraduate bachelor's degrees. Um, 37 of those are uh, graduate master's degrees. And six of those now are um, doctoral programs. Now, to go even further in the context for this project, uh, we wanted to give you kind of a snapshot of our library as well. Um, the Robert R. Muntz Library, or Muntz Library as we call it, um, it was built in 1982, um, so very recently after um, the institution was formed. We have four floors in our building. Um, we have a total of 19 library employees. Now, nine of those employees are full librarians, uh, professional librarians, and one of those um, is our director. Now, three of those total nine are actually library liaisons. So myself, Sarah Meischelcombe, and Christine Forche, we are three of the six liaison librarians. Um, and we also have 10 wonderful library staff members. 
Um, so actually prior to 2020, um, prior to the pandemic, our collection development policy was that we absolutely did not purchase any textbooks. Um, and you are about to see how drastically that has changed. So of course, um, when COVID-19 uh, really hit in the US, uh, like so many UT Tyler, uh, we moved to online only classes in the spring. Uh, we took an extended spring break um, so that our faculty could uh, get their heads on straight to try and you know <laughs> figure out what they were going to do. Um, now, during this process, it was very unclear for the library, of course, we weren't sure, you know, would we be coming back to campus? Would we not? Would the library be closed? Um, and as it turned out, um, our uh, university administration decided that the library should remain open. And we have remained open this entire time. Um, even during our statewide shutdown that lasted about two weeks, the library was still open and functioning. It's just the building really wasn't open, but we were still fully providing, of course, um, as much uh, access and services online as possible. Um, a lot of that had to do with the um, environmental uh, factors and economic factors uh, surrounding the East Texas region. As I said in the beginning, um, we're surrounded by a lot of very small rural communities. Um, there is a massive digital divide here among our uh, students and um, just our community members in general. Um, so one of the main concerns with, you know, closing the library was that our students who are now forced to take the rest of their classes online for the spring semester would not have access to internet access or just computers in general, um, or they wouldn't have any um, access to digital resources that they needed, such as their LMS, in order to contact their professors or even submit their coursework. So during this time, as the librarians were scrambling with everyone else on campus and pretty much the world, um, we found that our students were really suffering. Um, and I know that this is probably universal. Um, you know, everyone kind of observed this, but we noticed that, um, especially because our students did not have access to the campus and only limited access to the library and its resources, um, as well as the prohibitively high textbook costs. Um, I'm sure that we're all familiar with these. Um, and in addition, uh, I'm sure that anybody uh, who was stuck at home for any period during COVID-19 last year knows um, there was limited stocks and extreme delayed deliveries. Um, so if you try to order anything from Amazon or anything anywhere, um, there were some real limitations um, going on. So we noticed all of this. And as a group of librarians, we really um, began searching and brainstorming for solutions. And that led to our major and drastic change to our collection development policy. Um, so our textbook project, we decided that instead of continuing to purchase um, one-time uh, supplemental resources to boost our collection, um, that we would instead funnel those funds to purchasing textbooks for our students. Um, there was a lot of talk involved trying to decide, you know, who would we, like what colleges we would purchase for, what courses, so on and so forth. Um, and we determined that there were some major priorities that we wanted to um, take care of and then also be aware of certain limitations. Um, one of the main priorities is that all of the textbooks that we purchase are in electronic format. Um, and if at all possible, multiple users may access that title at, a, at one time. Uh, because nothing is more frustrating than when you're trying to access an ebook and somebody else has it checked out and it's one user at a time. Um, and going back to that electronic format, of course, making sure that our resources that we purchase are accessible off campus. Because there is such a digital divide in our community and surrounding areas, we wanted to ensure that none of our students had to concern themselves with how they're going to access their textbooks for 
for their courses um, if the library were to provide them. And of course, those limitations, cost, cost is everything. We don't have a money tree. We don't have unlimited funds, um, but we do have that standing um, financial budget, um, of course, that we already were using to purchase one-time um, resources. So making sure that we can get the best bang for our buck, um, the highest um, return on investment as far as which textbooks we purchase and um, how they're used. Um, and again, as I've already talked about, availability is everything and being able to provide access to those textbooks um, in the widest, uh, the widest variety, I guess, as possible. So that leads us to to buy or not to buy. Um, as a group of librarians, over seven colleges, that adds up to a lot of textbooks, um, to a lot of classes. So we really had to um, be strategic about which, which titles we were going to purchase. Um, the main things that influence our purchasing decisions, of course, are the number of students in the class and the number of sections of that class. So if we have um, maybe a, a doctoral level class that only is going to have about 12 students in it, and it's only offered once a year versus um, maybe a core class that's offered three times in a semester, um, every single semester at 50 or so students, um, each section, then that choice is pretty clear. We want to purchase that textbook that's going to um, make the biggest impact for our students. Um, and one thing that we have found um, throughout our process since we've started this textbook project is, are the textbooks required or simply recommended? Um, because we have definitely found that anything that's purchased that is simply recommended um, usually shows that the usage um, and the return on investment is fairly low compared to those that are required for a course. So passing it over to my colleague, Christine. Thank you, Sarah. So a little bit about implementing, putting this into action and what the results were. Of course, once we have a big program, or a new offering, whether it's a new database or um, a, a, a program going on, it's always, how do we get this message out? So we sent out direct messages through email to all of our faculty and staff and to all of our students, letting them know that we were purchasing the textbooks and that they would be available. We did a big push on social media and we had the announcement on our embedded LibGuides. Um, a, a few years ago, we were able to move to the LibGuide CMS so that we were able to embed those directly into our LMS, into Canvas. So we have a box on each of the guides that has special announcements for the library, and this was included. It also linked to our LibGuide about the textbooks, and I think there's a bigger picture on the next slide. Yes. So we trying to organize a project of the size is always challenging, but we put everything in order by which college um, the students were in and organized each of those tabs according to what the course was. We have a selection. Um, some of the, the courses use a lot of the same books every semester. So those are not listed separately as um, fall or spring. And then we have some where the courses are offered one semester, but not the other. So those are separated out, um, but they're all listed by the college and then by course number within the college. Some of the numbers for this in the fall, we were able to purchase 116 titles that cost the library $14,500. If every student that registered for the class used the library textbook, there would be a cost avoidance of $130,000. So quite a good return on investment um, for the students if they so chose. For the spring, we purchased an additional 133, ti 133 titles. Uh, for a cost of $18,000. And if all of the students and re registered for those classes use those books, their cost avoidance would be $101,000. So we had the potential to have some really um, 
impressive savings there for our students. We also had books that were already included in our collection that may or may not have been um, requested by faculty. They might have just been part of our various collections anyway, and we were able to put those on the research guide and advertise them as, hey, you may not have known, but we actually had this book that you need for this class. Our e-resources team is still working on data for all of the usage, so we don't have a ton of numbers yet, but I was able to look at our spreadsheet for ProQuest's eBook Central. That is our primary vendor for the textbooks. Um, we had numbers for our September through April, and we had a total of 41,192 requests for 130 books. Um, as I mentioned before, that could include titles that we already own or the ones that we additionally purchased for the textbook project. But the number of requests, this is part of the problem with finding the data on this, is that different vendors have different ways of sending you the information about the usage. So what we are able to pull right now from ProQuest was just the total number of requests, and we could break it down by month. Um, with that, you can definitely see the books that were required for fall. September would have the most number of requests, maybe a handful in October, and then hardly anything for November or December, because by that time, the students have already gotten their information that they needed from their textbooks. Um, and the same for the spring. You would have large numbers in January and February with dwindling numbers for April and, and May. Um, I see Andrea has a question about the sense of the number of unique requests. We don't at this time. Um, because of the way the stats come out for us, it's very time consuming to try to, to pull that data out. And our e-resources team is working on it, but we probably won't have those numbers for a while. Um, we do have, again, just looking at the books from ProQuest, we did have 53 books that were included on our um, LibGuide that we don't have any usage stats for. And that seems to indicate that the books were not requested. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways that we can find out why they wouldn't have been requested, whether it was because we didn't get it advertised well enough or the faculty members didn't have any buy-in into that program, so they didn't talk about it. As we all know, you can have the best stuff going on in the world, but if the faculty members don't tell students, hey, you need to do this, most of them aren't going to go out of their way to find out, <laughs> to find out about it. So um, it could be that students didn't want ebooks. You know, there I know that when I'm reading information that I need to remember long term. I do a lot better with that when I'm reading in print. And so if I had the money, I would probably spend the money buying a book. So there, I'm sure there are students who felt that way about some of the books. Um, it's really hard to tell. We will probably, once we start looking at numbers, we will probably try to do some surveys to find out um, information about why or why students did not um, use those textbooks. Um, David asked if we have demand-driven acquisitions available. We do have those available. Um, and we could probably make that part of the program. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if that's how we already had some of the titles was through that program. Um, but I am not a member of the e-resources team, so I'm probably not qualified to make uh, statements <laughs> too, too, um, too forcefully about that either way. The reception from our administrators and faculty was incredible. Um, we had one of our history professors who was super excited because she knew her graduate students would be really excited. And just having looked at those numbers, I can tell you that I'm pretty sure she told all of her students and they used it because those books had really good usage. Um, our director of student engagement was really excited about letting our parent coordinator know so that they could tell the parents. As we all know, the parents are going to be <laughs> looking for money 
savings a lot of the time. And if they can find out that, hey, I can save $300 this semester on books, that's great. Who wouldn't want that? And then the last quote is from our provost who said he appreciates our efforts and it shows where our passion lies with student success. Our tagline for our university is your success, our passion. So that quote definitely feeds into um, his recognition of our program working with the mission of our university. I've noticed a couple of other questions here. Um, the textbooks used more in the STEM fields. And as the STEM librarian, I can definitely tell you that was much more difficult. A lot of our textbooks for the STEM areas are um, through like Pearson and they have the whole packets that come with the online information. And those typically are not available as a library ebook. And if they are, they're not available with multiple users. So that was definitely more challenging. Um, and if we're promoting OER, Michelle, yes, we will get to that in a moment. Um, and Edward, with the business fields, definitely. Um, Sarah could probably speak more to that, but looking over our statistics for just the ThrowQuest books, business was probably the area where we had the second best usage of the eBooks. Um, as far as the number of access points that we had for that, maybe not as high, but compared to the number of students in those classes, probably definitely. <clears throat> Um, so we're working on further semesters for summer right now we have ordered 27 new textbooks and we already have access to 25 and we are starting to work on our fall textbooks requests um, as our director sent out an email at the beginning of the semester letting faculty know about the um, textbooks that we had for the semester they started flooding us all of the liaisons with requests for this is the book I'm going to be using for the summer, or this is the book that I'm going to be using for the fall. And as far as I know, if our budget holds, we will continue to do this for the foreseeable future. With that, I'll send it over to Sarah Meischel-Cohn to talk a little bit about those next steps and to address some of those questions about OER. Yes, and we'll definitely be getting into some discussion of OER. So some of our next steps, one of the biggest things that we need to do is to continue our outreach. Um, even though we've been doing this for about a year, there are a lot of people who still don't know about the program that's going on. Um, we, I have had the experience lots of times of students hopping on to our library chat and saying, hey, my professor said we have this, said you have this, but I don't know where it is. So there's some communication there that needs to be done to make sure that everybody knows, yes, we have some textbooks, not all textbooks. Um, and where they are and how students can use them. We also have been working on talking with faculty about how they can consult their librarian when they want to move to a new textbook. We've done a workshop about this um, and we want to let faculty know and we've gotten some good feedback from faculty that when they want to change textbooks or when they're thinking about what they're assigning for the semester that we as librarians can look up their books, see if it's something that the library could buy. And if it's not, we can suggest OER, or we could also suggest another book that would be affordable for the library to purchase. And the biggest thing that we have been doing is moving OER to the, to the forefront. We really want to move away from the really expensive textbooks or the course packs and try to get faculty more aware of the OER that is available. The UT system does support the creation of OER among faculty, um, and we really want to become more of a hub for sharing information with faculty about what is out there, and if it's not out there, what they can create. Um, this is just the banner that is on our library website that shows everybody that heads there that there are textbooks available. The issue of, is, of course, that you have to get to the library website to see this. So again, just continuing our outreach, making sure that we're mentioning it in all of the classes that we visit in our social media. And then of course, when students come into the library or come into the chat with questions, we wanna make sure that they have this link to our lib guide so they can find their books again really easily. Before we move forward with our next steps, we wanna think about what we've learned from this process so far. 
one thing is the importance of having a goal. When we started this, we really just jumped into it because we were in that COVID scramble. I happened to start working here um, in March of last year. So I jumped right into the COVID scramble. Um, and our goal at the time was just to say, okay, how can we help our students? How can we help our faculty get everything online? But over the course of the last two semesters, we have started to change that goal to a bigger discussion about the textbooks that get assigned on our campus, how the cost of textbooks really affect the students that we have, our students, a lot of our students work, a lot of our students are parents, um, a lot of our students don't have that extra money for an expensive textbook. So really trying to communicate with faculty about the options that are out there for them. We found that being proactive really worked. Again, we kind of just did this. We didn't have any like faculty input when we started buying textbooks, we were like, this is what the library can do really quickly and easily to help our students. And when we, when we went to our faculty and we said, hey, we have your textbook for this class, they were like, oh, that's great. This is amazing. This is like such a gift for you to have already done this. Um, so we got a lot of communication from faculty members who maybe don't usually communicate with the library because we were coming to them saying, hey, we already did this for you. And of course, we found that librarians are not the only ones who are frustrated with textbooks. We knew that students were frustrated. We all get emails from students asking, do you have our textbook? Can you get our textbook? I haven't been able to buy my textbook this semester. But we, when we started talking to faculty more about textbook costs, we were hearing the same thing from them. We were hearing, you know, students are worried, faculty are worried that the bookstore won't have the book first thing in the beginning of the semester. They're worried that there are students who are not able to buy the book. So if the li if library does have their book, then there's no reason that the student shouldn't be able to get it. And then I also, I really don't want to go through this whole 2020, 2021 year without learning anything. So I really think that it's important to reflect on what we've learned from the pandemic. And the things that we've talked about are, of course, the economic disparity among our students. Um, we've seen that in, in sharper focus, I think, than we ever have in the past. The digital divide, as you mentioned before, um, during that time that Sarah Norrell was discussing when the library was still open, but the campus, for the most part, was closed, there were students in here every day. Um, there were lots of regulars who would come in to use the computers and to like get some of that tech help that librarians and library staff can provide. But on the flip side of that, we've also seen that going online really works for some people. Um, students who have asynchronous classes can still go to their jobs, they can still take care of their families, do whatever responsibilities they have, and still be able to get their education. And hopefully with an ebook, they would be able to have that with them wherever they need to go. Um, a lot of our ebooks, yes, you need online access to get them, but they can also be downloaded. So once you have something downloaded, you can take that anywhere. And then we've also seen compassion in teaching um, in this last year and how valuable that has been to really see the humanness in ourselves and our colleagues and our students and, and recognize that like textbooks are expensive. This is one thing we can do to show compassion, to be helpful and to really understand where our students are coming from when they, they tell us about their worries about the cost of higher ed. And finally, doing things differently can be good. Like we said, we did not buy textbooks in the past, and now we do, and it's been really great. And why didn't we think of that before? Our next steps for this, of course, are continuing our outreach about textbooks and the cost and access of textbooks. There is now a campus-wide push for OER um, coming from our provost. So again, the library can be a hub for that. We already do have some OER on our campus and we have quite a bit of OER information available from the library and we want people to know that we're here to help them. We also need to do some outreach about eBooks themselves. A lot of our students come to the library expecting a physical book and we don't necessarily know how to use an eBook. So we want students to know what to expect when they're using an eBook. Again, a lot of our books are from ProQuest, some of them are from other places. A lot of the history books are available through JSTOR. So we want students to know that there are those different formats there so that they're not surprised when they see something that's different. If they click through that little guide and there are three books for the class and they all look totally different, we want them to know that, that that's okay, that's how it is. 
And we also want them to know that we're here for when they do have trouble accessing books. We also want to involve our students more. Most of our outreach has been focused on faculty and staff, but we're thinking about transitioning that to focus more on students. We know that if students start to get excited about OER, that will drive interest in OER um, in faculty and in administration. And finally, we need to do more assessment. We did not uh, start this program with any assessment planned. And so we need to figure out how we how we can break down those numbers, how we can use them, and how we can also use that assessment to show the value of this program to our campus partners. If you are starting your own program, here are a few things to think about. One is your goal. Is your goal simply to get textbooks to students, or is it to sort of do what we did where we transitioned from just getting textbooks to students to talking more about textbooks and textbook costs and really trying to move into this OER push. How is this relevant at your institution? You might be a lot further along on OER than we are, so there might be a difference in relevance. You might have a much more residential campus than we do, so maybe there is more interest in print, maybe there's a lot of traffic at the library and a different type of textbook collection would make sense. You can also think about scalability. You could start really big, you could start really small, you could start with a single department, you could start with focusing on textbooks for core classes or for classes with high enrollment, or this could maybe be tied into a first year experience program. There's also, of course, the issue of sustainability with this program. Are we going to continue to have the money to do this? And how can we generate interest so that maybe we do get something added to our budget? And if not, is there a different way that we can we can go with this? And then finally, having assessment plans in place is very valuable. A few final thoughts. We want to stay relevant, having those books that students needs, that student needs um, keeps us relevant, keeps students coming in, gets more engagement. Our first duty is always to support our students. So we want to keep our students at the forefront of our decision making. And then this has been an opportunity for us to show students and faculty what librarians do. There are always people that don't know, you know, what does a librarian do all day? We've all been asked that question. So this is this has been an opportunity for us to get out there and show the value of the library and the value of what we do. A few resources that we looked at um, that we want to share with everybody. And finally, we have time for questions. We absolutely do. Um, I know you answered a lot of questions as we were rolling along. So I'm going to start from about 10 minutes back. Uh, the one that came across at 1233 from uh, Angela Chicoero and just start reading down the list. If you posted something earlier than that, that you feel like was not answered by the presentation, just type it in again and we'll get to it. Okay, so Angela asks, in what ways do you support faculty interested in adopting OER? So I'll jump in on that. Um, I personally have worked very closely as the business liaison librarian, and I know there was a question regarding like business uh, titles specifically. Um, I have worked very closely with um, several of my business faculty uh, in adopting, but not just adopting, but also I really, we really try to work very closely, um, almost in a you know one-on-one -on -one type of relationship to to really discuss the the class that they are interested in adopting an OER, um, looking for available resources, not just textbooks, but also, you know, what I like to do is just do a wide search, just give them anything that I think might you know touch on their topic, be relevant in any way whether it's a full course package, whether it's just a textbook, whether it's a slide deck, you know, whatever. Um, because I think that providing um, as many options for a faculty member really um, kind of opens their mind to the idea of OER. Um, I know at UT Tyler, and my colleagues can probably back me up on this, we have had a large push um, from the top down for OER. Um, the problem has been there has been a lot of miscommunication and I think some misconceptions about what OER actually are, um, what they look like, how they can be used, and you know, things like that. 
And so now I feel like um, we've had that that top down push, but then also the library is trying to like meet in the middle with that top down push and say, hey, we're here to help you with this. Uh, let's let's um, you know have a discussion about this. Let's talk about what OER you know actually are like and things like that. I think the biggest misconception on our campus or in our institution is probably that to use an OER, you have to create an OER, um, you know, like from scratch. And so really trying to get the word out, market ourselves, educate as much as possible, um, you know, things like that. Um, so I don't know if my colleagues want to add anything to that or if I answered your question. Um, I will just mention that there are there are grants available from the UT system and our university is again just beginning to have more of an OER push so I imagine there will be incentives coming for faculty who want to adopt OER. Okay, uh, Michelle Toth asks, any follow-up or alternatives for textbook requests that could not be met by providing an online text? I have had sort of the interesting experience of one of my departments deciding that they wanted to pony up their own money to start buying uh, textbooks. And that has sort of evolved into its own thing where it looks like we're going to have more of a um, print reserve collection because the faculty in that department were pretty attached to the books that they currently have. And a lot of those are just not available as eBooks. And that is something that we, have encountered for a lot of the requests that we get. There's just not an ebook available. And the instructors who are willing to um, engage with us and, and look for other alternatives, um, I've had some success with that. I've had a couple of instructors end up finding another book that was available through the library, especially in the communication department. Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Metzger, I know the answer to this one. It says, do you, did you have any kind of course reserves program before this? I know you said you didn't really do textbooks. Um, we have the program where if the professor wants to bring in their copy, right. we'll put that on reserve. And occasionally there will be something in the stacks, but yeah. that was about it. And in fact, when I was looking at our research guide, there's a whole segment of um, the education, the reading classes that have a large number of their books on reserve because they are kids' books or what have you, so they, right. they have a big selection of them. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Isabel wants to know, did students come to the library to try to print out the e-books? Not that I've Not encountered. Okay, yeah. Let's see, Amanda Pippet wants to know, is the collection development policy change only allowing for textbooks as eBooks? Were there any print textbooks used and put on physical reserves since your library was open? Our collection development po uh, policy is really going all eBooks all the time. Um, if, like I said, uh, for one of my departments, if they wanna spend their own money, we will buy a print book, um, but it's, fairly rare that we buy print anything at this point. Okay. Uh, Christine Moore wants to know, in balancing textbook selection as a matter of academic freedom, how do UT faculty leaders see push for uh, OER versus university, not just library responsibility for making required texts available at low slash no cost to students, regardless of actual cost of materials? I'll grab that one because that comes up in faculty senate a lot and we do have quite a number of faculty who roll their eyes and are like I'm so sick of hearing about OER when our faculty or when our students going to take responsibility for their own learning and this is part of being responsible and my as yet unreleased <laughs> unreleased response to that is that you know, there's a big anti higher ed movement in the country right now. And a lot of that has to do with return on investment and the cost. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want them to take it out of your ability to have TAs or RAs or um, raises, 
<laughs> you know, we've, we've got to lower those costs somewhere. And this is one area where you can do it <laughs> really relatively easy. Um, we definitely have people who are big cheerleaders, you know, it's, they are all about it. They're always telling people like, go talk to your library and they can help you with this. We get that about Sarah Norrell a lot because of the work that she's done with some of her business faculty. Um, it, it's, it's a very mixed response, but I think that our state legislature is moving in the direction of um, not giving the faculty as much academic freedom on that as they would like. <laughs> Diplomatically put. <laughs> Every uh, once in a while I try. <laughs> yeah. Michelle Bear um, put, uh, asked a very good question here. Are you concerned about managing expectations? We find that because we buy some textbooks, some students expect we will buy all textbooks. I'll take that one. Um, yes. <laughs> so when we first started this project, um, <clears throat> last year, it was, you know, like we've mentioned, it was just kind of a all hands on deck, everybody in, do what you can, you know, like, let's just roll this out, you know, as best as we can, as quickly as possible. And as the word has started getting out, um, which is great, uh, we've also had a lot of questions of like, well, why couldn't you get my textbook? I sent it in just like you asked me to, um, you know, when we, when we as librarians send out those emails to our faculty and say, hey, you know, we're currently purchasing, you know, textbooks and things like that. Um, some of us, I think a lot based on our subject areas, some of us get a lot of responses, some of us not so much. Um, and so, um, you know, previously, several years ago, when our collection development policy was, do you have any requests for supplemental materials you would like to add to the library collection? Uh, we oftentimes would get crickets, you know? And so now that people are starting to speak up, they think that, well, I spoke up, so you're getting my textbook, right? Um, and so I think that that really is just providing us an opportunity. It's a little painful at first. It's a lot like ripping off a Band-Aid, in my opinion. Um, but as we explain, you know, this really comes down, like the library has limited funding. If you would like us to purchase more, please advocate to administration that we should get a little bit of a better budget so we can purchase your textbooks and support your students, you know, and things like that. So really it can be a great tool um, if you can kind of turn it around that way um, to advocate for the library and how we support students. But then also going off of a, the larger conversation we've been having, this really does provide a fantastic opportunity to discuss with your faculty other options besides these expensive textbooks um, when they're so frustrated that their students aren't purchasing the required texts and that the library also cannot afford the required texts. So things like OER and low cost options. Yeah. Uh, Adam asks, how long do students have access to the textbook until class ends or until they graduate? That uh, largely depends on the, the vendor, what their model is for the checkout. Okay. Um, but, Part of the reason that we tend only to purchase the books with unlimited users is so that even if the the format for the vendor is you get this book for three weeks, they can go back and get it again after another three weeks and another three weeks. Um, but also, I don't know if this helps answer the question as well. Since we're purchasing these textbooks and just putting it in the library collection, as long as the student is a registered student, they can come in and access it. It doesn't matter if they're registered in that class that specific semester. If they want to go back and check it, you know, right before they graduate, two years after they've taken the class, they can do so. Uh, then we've got Rebecca. Uh, do you have numbers of uh, requested titles that you couldn't get access to or that you could only get single users, et cetera. I think she's ask, asking for any statistics you might have. We don't have, I don't currently have the specific numbers on that. I think that is still part of the full report that our e-resources team is working up. I can tell you that in the spring when we were <laughs> spending three days solid looking for all the books we could, that I, I submitted requests for 74 books and I ended up getting seven. 
So um, I think my the STEM areas, the science and the math tend to be more likely for that to happen because as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of those package deals uh, that get used on our campus that if I have to say OpenStax has stuff like that one more time, I might like just get it tattooed <laughs> on my forehead. Um, <laughs> I, I'm always mentioning to my faculty, like, hey, you know, that comes from rice and that's the Harvard of the South. So they've got good stuff. Um, yeah. Or, you know, Harvard is the rice of the North. But that's just a Texan way of putting it. Being from Oklahoma <laughs> originally, I died. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a um, transplant. I mean, yeah. um, let's see, a little bit of back and forth on Michelle's question about managing expectations. Um, let's see, Anna would like to know what percentage of your current textbooks are OER? That is something that we, uh, <laughs> we compiled a list recently and I, I don't know <laughs> what ended up, but we ended up finding that there were more OER and low cost textbooks than we expected. So that's another report that is in the works. Ooh. Watch the space basically. Yeah. And I also think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about as to needing, um, make sure that if you're going to do your own program like this, make sure that you have like some assessment goals and that you keep up with assessment as you go. Um, since uh, the context of us launching this program was in the middle of just the craziness of 2020, um, we've just been in the process of just playing catch up this whole time. And we're still playing catch up right now, which is why we don't have a bunch of hard stats for you all. Um, if you'd like to follow up, we can certainly get those to you, but it's it's been a process. <laughs> yep. yep. I feel you that to this there. Yeah. yeah. So everybody can see our email addresses. If you oh, good idea. Follow. Yeah. Put the contact info there. Um, let's see. Uh, David Alexander makes a, a, a suggestion I like. Um, how about a library fee added to tuition to support the textbook program? <laughs> David, I'm going to assume you don't live in Texas. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a nice thought. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen wants to know, um, how did you get the list of books from the bookstore or the faculty themselves? Both. Uh, the bookstore has been willing to uh, work with us and, and give us the list. I think they assume that a certain number of students are always going to go out and buy the book if they can afford it. Um, so they are, you know, they're still in business. We also have had semesters or classes where we've had to look through the bookstores listings to find out what the, the required books are. And then faculty have also sent in this. So we're, we're getting information from numerous sources. And uh, before anybody asks, the bookstore has, has not been mad at us about this so far. Yeah, in a previous life, I, I was in charge of, you know, a a, a similar project with textbook reserves. And um, I think they saw it as sort of a win-win that yes, students would come in to copy off a page or two, but hopefully that would then encourage them to just buy a copy. So, yeah. Um, let's see some more back and forth on uh, Michelle Bear's question. Um, Rebecca, something I wanna amplify there. Certain publishers do not make e-textbooks available to libraries at any price and some are stupendously expensive. It's frustrating. I think all of us on this call would say amen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> David Alice, Alexander did uh, reply. He's from South Dakota, uh, even more conservative, but I think the idea of lowering student costs makes a library fee worth bringing up. Um, yeah, and, and the I agree. Pub, pub, yeah, it, 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 you know, it's definitely worth a conversation. Um, let's see, always tricky to navigate that relationship with bookstores. I think I, um, I think we've covered all the questions. It seems to be mostly chit chat at this point. Does anybody, we are at five, uh, four minutes to the hour. So does anybody want to get in one last question before we go or are we good? Seeing lots of thank yous. Thank you for a great discussion. Uh, okay, I think we are good. Um, thank you to our wonderful panelists, Sarah, Christine, and Sarah. Um, thank you to all of our participants for asking great questions. This was a good discussion. 
you're always worried about it just being crickets with these things. So it's 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 a, it's a great uh, it, it's a great for the presenters and uh, for everyone else. So unless there's anything else, I think we are uh, ready to call this a day. Any final thoughts from our uh, from our presenters? Thank you very much Nicole. and good luck. Yes. Yep, Thank and again, there's uh, the contact info there if you want to get more of those detailed questions about statistics answered. Uh, Rebecca says, please come back and present your final findings. <laughs> yeah, we may have to figure out a way to do a part two on this one because mm -hmm. I have some curiosity about this as well. Um, okay, so thank you all, all for coming and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for the great conversation, y'all. Take care. Bye.